Gee, do I have a live mic here? I feel like I should stand up. This seems like a club rather than a presentation, doesn't it? Um, so in any event, what do I think is happening right now with the consumer? I think the consumer is really healthy, and I think despite those little cracks that we saw a Citicorp report the other day, I don't really think anything's going on with the consumer that's very negative. I mean, we have record employment, low unemployment, low energy costs, rising wages. Mm -hmm. It seems like an ideal time. Oh, gee, it seemed like that last fourth quarter too, though, but, you know, because all those things were already true. So I guess I should worry about a little more than I do, but I think the consumer will be quite healthy. I think the 4% number that people are throwing around on sales growth is probably real. I think the real question is, where does it come? Because if you get 4% sales growth and you get 20% online growth, the range of estimates I've seen has been 16 to 22, what does that leave for the brick and mortar stores? And when the brick and mortar stores don't see real growth or much growth, it's very, uh, frustrating for people like me who have spent their whole life in retailing and follow most companies who own a whole lot of brick and mortar stores. So I, I don't, I'm not as positive on it from the point of view of my client base as I have been in past years where I thought there was going to be 4% growth because I keep see, seeing the fourth quarters fail for brick and mortar retailers from the point of view of traffic and sales and I see that business move online. So when you look at, at the retailers, I mean, you take a company like Williams-Sonoma that's 55% online now, or Urban Outfitters that's 38% online, or Macy's that's, what, 22, 23% online. So you keep seeing the business move someplace besides the stores. And I guess that's my concern about the fourth quarter, not the health of the consumer. So Steve, from the perspective of an asset manager, what do you think? Yeah, I would echo that sentiment. When you look across the consumer, I think there's a, it's kind of a mosaic, right? And you have a lot of noise around the edges in terms of, oh, subprime is doing this, you know, you, everyone saw the city cards report. Um, but take a half step back and you think about kind of the Occam's razor answer to the consumer, which is you have two facts that have always predicted consumer-led recessions. Uh, credit market duress inverted yield curve has been right seven in the last seven recessions. So every single recession since the 1960s, credit market duress has signaled an uh, uh, impending recession. Housing has signaled six of the last seven recessions and obviously did so in a resounding way in 2008. Now, an aside on that, I think the inverted yield curve everyone understands, housing, people actually, even after 08, don't really focus on. It's pretty stunning. And I think the reason why is because when you look at stock market capitalization, housing is severely underrepresented as a percentage of total market capitalization in US stock markets. Because most of housing's asset value lies in residential mortgages. So when you talk about these headlines about, oh my goodness, look at the pullback in subprime, is this, an, is this a signal of impending things? And yes, we should not be able to go buy a mattress on eight year you know, financing. Um, and you know, that should not be out there. Those things, it's naturally healthy for that kind of stuff to pull backwards. But consider the sizes of the markets you're talking about. All of consumer lending, X housing, is three and a half trillion dollars. The housing single family residential mortgage market is 10 trillion dollars. So when you talk about on the margin, a couple hundred million pulling out of subprime, and I would say that today the FICO score of an average home buyer is 725, and that FICO score in 2003, pre the bubble, was 700. So we see credit loosening at the bank level, and with credit loosening on residential single mortgages, that means that that person in Texas with a family of four can now go put down money and buy a $250,000 house in a major lo credit loosening way. That goes contra to the fact that, hey, maybe on the margin, they have to put down 100 extra dollars when they get a loan on their auto. Um, and so I think it's really credit at the end of the day, both credit through housing and credit through the broader credit markets that are going to drive our economy as it always has. Um, and from that perspective, things are quite healthy. So from the perspective of the retail consumer, the Jan, you and I talked about just spending habits and, and experiential versus millennial versus online. What trends do you think are actual sea changes and which ones were just they're sort of blips and things will revert back to the mean? Jan? Or, or well... What I think is happening right now is exactly what the whole rest of the world seems to be thinking is happening, which is experiential spending is outpacing spending on stuff. 
And I think that's not just the millennials. It's driven by all across the economy. So I think we're seeing that. But I don't think that means that a brick and mortar store with a great experience for the consumer can't win. It can. I think the problem is we've all talked a good game on experiential selling, but we've not done anything to actually give the consumer the experience they want in the store. We've been given the consumer the experience we want to give them or we can afford to give them. And it's very interesting. I spent three days in Copenhagen last week with uh, 20. 400 people that invest in retail or run retail, and mostly Europeans, and, and they looked at it, and they were all talking about experiential retailing just like we are, but they were also saying things like, the consumer wants it to be their experience. They want it to be just for them. They want it to be something like Rafa Bicycle, where you go on the bicycle tour with them, you buy the bicycle from them, you buy your bicycle stuff from them, you meet your significant other with them, you stay with them the rest of your life, and you go on these things forever, right? That's damn hard to supply. They've managed to, but can the rest of us do that? It's really, really hard. So I was just talking to a uh, CEO of uh, Tommy Bahama, and they've now tested a new, you know, they have restaurant formats, right, not just stores. They've tested a new one that is sort of a walk-up bar that they're calling the Marlin, where you get a drink, you can get food in eight minutes. That's really good. The food is under 12 bucks, so it's kind of fast food, but it's not cheap, right? And it's extraordinarily popular where they've introduced it because they've knocked out one wall of the store and they've basically put this great bar in. And you get a lot more traffic into the store and the store traffic's up like, I don't know, 30% was this enormous number. And I said, wow, why don't we all do that? And then I was like, well, you know, because we can't all do that. And we're having a hard time figuring out what to do. If you look at something like King of Prussia Mall, which is a good example, that just spent a quarter billion dollars to expand and improve and added 155,000 square feet. They now have 47 restaurants. I'm not sure the solution to experiential retailing is 100% restaurants, but that's one of the things people are looking for, but they've got to get much more personal than that if they're going to get you in the store to stay there. They, you have to feel like it's for you, that it means something to you. It's not just this broad-based thing that invites you in. I would say that it, from an allocator's perspective, this sort of theme, less as it pertains specifically to retail, but perhaps more as it pertains to the changes in consumer tastes and behavior patterns touch on a variety of areas we think about, in particular the real estate market, everything from REITs to CMBS to private real estate funds um, will be impacted by the value of what was formerly retail space um, because it's unclear exactly what that will house going forward. But um, you know, you look at the music industry, for example, which perhaps was one of the first um, sort of top of mind types of consumption that were, was really profoundly disrupted by technology. And today, with Vivendi spinning off its, its music subsidiary, you see a, a, a real resurgence in the value from, from an investor's perspective of, of music franchises. And that's because that particular industry has figured out this exact sort of trend towards experiential um, ways to, to capture value for, for the consumer um, has meant that concert concerts and music festivals and the like are much more valuable now. Um, so what we try and think about um, it, in allocating capital are, are the managers that seem to be ahead of the curve anticipating these behavioral changes. One example, um, which I was actually surprised to learn about was the, the ownership of Cirque du Soleil by uh, TPG Group. I'm not sure many people are aware of that, but they sort of saw, that's an example of a sort of off the wall idea. Um, and you see Cirque du Soleil, they have big expansion plans in China. It, it's really quite interesting. So I think it touches on a number of different sort of parts of an allocator's thought process. One other question, Robert, you know, Rokatan deals with the world's largest pension plans and you guys have been evaluating managers for decades. In this particular space, when you're trying to evaluate, what are you looking for and how do you want managers to think about because the world shifted, how they're running money shifted. So what are you looking for to be like, that, that manager actually has a good handle on what's going on and can translate it to alpha? I think it's a, in particular, since so much of this change is technology driven, having a real understanding for and an edge with respect to data. You can collect information in so many different ways now, um, in particular in the retail space and with respect to the consumer. Um, a healthy sense for the cyclicality of any given investment idea. We don't. See, we would agree that generally the consumer 
domestically feels pretty healthy right now by any reasonable statistical measure, but there's also this sense of, there, there's this underlying fragility, I think, to at least the psychology of the average consumer with pressure from, yes, from healthcare costs increasing, uh, relatively high levels of indebtedness, even, even though they might compare favorably to levels 10 years ago, things like that. So um, that's what I would say we think about. I think you've got to, you want to... It's really interesting because I think exactly about the consumer the way you just described it, and I think most of us do. But when I was in Europe, I got an alternative view that I thought was really interesting. People said to me, you know, U.S. consumer spending is not keeping up with the wealth growth, and it always has in the past. And I said, hmm, I hadn't thought about that. And they said, well, you know, right now, the wealth growth from 2008 was well, it, it, by any measure that we've seen in the past, you should be spending more like 5, 5 5.5%, not 3.5%, 4%. And so they were asking themselves and asking me, so is this a new normal in the United States, or are we going to see a reversion to the mean, and suddenly luxury goods are going to go crazy in the States again? Because they haven't been very good. And they were thinking about, of course, LVM, or Louis Vuitton and Gucci and Hermes and all of those sorts of things. But, but there's lots of other luxury goods that could go crazy. It wouldn't have to be just those brands. And I, I suddenly said to myself, I don't know. I don't know if this is the new normal and it's like the post-Great Recession, now that we're, we're post-Great Depression, now we're post-Great Recession, it's going to be a very long time before people start spending wealth again. Or am I just going, oh, maybe I'm just wrong and we're about to see this reversion again where people say, oh, things are back to normal and luxury goods take off. The Europeans think that about us. We don't think that about us, but it's kind of interesting that they see the whole thing differently over there. I mean, when it, I mean, to your point, I mean, when it comes to traditional retail, there's a deflationary effect going on with a lot of the new offerings, like right, with what Amazon presents, right? And then on top of that, you have a lot of shift in spend to other areas. So, for instance, I, I you know mentioned housing and the size of that. I mean, we've seen a continued secular shift to housing. And look, to put you know ten thousand, twenty thousand, two hundred thousand dollars down on a house. Um, and then pay the mortgage for that, that does cut into your discretionary spending, as well as if you look at what uh, gas prices look like year over year and the year over the prior year, uh, if, you, if you look at the healthcare expenditures. So there are a lot of different things eating into it, right? But, but to the, my point about deflation, um, let, let me just do this quick exercise, because I think it'll surprise you, but also illustrate the level of the threat, right? So I have here a shirt. Does anyone want to guess how much this shirt cost? This is Amazon Prime, business casual shirt. Sir, do you want to guess how much it costs? $29.99. Okay. This shirt is $4.07, Amazon Prime, next day delivered to your house. So for the cost of dry cleaning in New York, <laughs> delivered, you throw it away. delivered two days quicker than dry cleaning in New York. You can buy a brand new shirt at Amazon that you know none of us would be wearing here, but look, let's face it. I mean, in the office on a Friday. <laughs> so we don't need to know. Not a bad shirt. See, not the retail expert shirt. says not a bad shirt. Four dollars seven cents online. Um, so the, I think the problem is going back to the shift in landscape. You have a you have a competitor in Amazon that has a very different cost of capital requirement 